February is American Heart Month, a great time for all people to focus on their cardiovascular health. Despite significant progress in research and treatment options, heart disease continues to be the leading cause of death in the United States, claiming the lives of more than 650,000 people each year. Primary care physician Dr. Maria Ferreira and cardiologist Dr. Alan Jackson will discuss heart disease risk factors and prevention methods. Plus, they'll take your questions. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's start off with having each one of you introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do here at U Chicago Medicine, and you're both uh, new to the program. I've never had either one of you on, so thank you both for being here today. We really appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Jackson, we're going to start with you since you're you're up here at the table. Oh, you do well, the short straw. You have to right. be up here. Well, I'm a cardiologist here at uh, University of Chicago. I'm a native Chicagoan, um, and uh, happy to be here. Fantastic. And Dr. Ferrer? Hi, uh, my name is Maria Ferreira. I'm one of the primary care physicians at our River East location. I t um, control and manage chronic medical condition conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and I'm very grateful to be here today. Thank you for having me. And I want to give a shout out to our River East facility because it's one of our newer uh, one of our newer facilities, and it's, it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place to, to get care. I, I do it myself there. So um, really wonderful to have both of you on the program today. So I do want to remind viewers that we will be taking questions from you. So if you want to type them in the comment section, we'll try to get to as many as possible over the next half hour. And we're going to start off with some kind of some basics. You know, we, we heard a little bit in the intro to the program that heart disease is unfortunately still pretty common in the United States, even though we know more about it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and explain what's going on there? Why is it still so common? I, I, I would imagine I have some idea. Well, um, we look at the risk factors for heart disease. They include high blood pressure, diabetes, tobacco, and cholesterol, for example. And we're not controlling those like we should. People aren't really <clears throat> making decisions with diet that are um, sort of good for them. Some people continue to smoke. And so these things contribute to uh, the sort of prevalence of heart disease. Exactly. So Dr. Ferreira, could you talk to us a little bit about heart disease and how it affects women um, and people of color? I think oftentimes we, we, we think of men having heart attacks, but heart disease is a, is a real killer of, of women as well and, and something that people need to be quite aware of. Absolutely. Uh, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. And it's the leading cause of death uh, is the number one killer in women above the age of 25, uh, regardless of their race or ethnicity. So it's definitely very common. Um, in African Americans too, is also the risk increases, mainly because we find in them that they have higher risk factors that leads to heart disease, for example, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. And, and yeah, there's just a, a higher prevalence in communities of color. And I know that's an area that that uh, folks here at UChicago Medicine have have uh, been doing some work to try to try to improve those numbers, but it's been it's been a challenge so far. I don't know if you care to talk about that at all, or what do you tell your parent your patients when you when you uh, talk to them about you know maybe how they can help with lifestyle choices that sort of thing. Well, uh, when a patient comes into our office, we really try to do a global risk assessment of trying to identify what risk factors they have that might increase the risk of having heart disease. So we go into a various questions because like I said, it's very comprehensive. We dig into past medical history, you know, uh, the patient themselves might have any already a diagnosed, um, a diagnosis of high blood pressure or diabetes. We also look into their past family history, which plays a big part. And then also we look into their um, activities. For example, are they exercising the way that they should? Are they eating healthy? Are they sleeping well? And so by identifying these risk factors, we can already um, note if somebody is at a, in a different group and has a higher risk of having heart disease. Sleep is one of the things that you just mentioned that I think is very interesting. And we, I want to spend a little bit more time on that later in the program because it's amazing, you know, as a, we talk to various physicians how important sleep is just in, <coughs> in overall health. And I just, I think that's fascinating. So, so uh, Dr. Jackson, if you can talk to us, uh, diabetes is something that we, we, we hear 
uh, a lot about on the program, and we, we talk about this and its impact on other diseases. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about diabetes the, and, and, and how, um, how that triggers heart disease and, and what do you do with your patients that specifically? So <clears throat> diabetes is perhaps the um, most important uh, factor in developing heart disease. So we try and make sure, <clears throat> working with our primary care physicians, that we keep it under control. One of the things I emphasize is a vegetarian or vegan diet because um, that can help control that kind of thing. Diabetes also has an impact on cholesterol and lipid metabolism. So it's kind of the lead in to a lot of different issues with um, heart disease. It helps accelerate the coronary artery disease development. And you know, we, we talk about Americans' <clears throat> diets and, and I, you know, I, I, I know I'm guilty here as well. And it's, it's, it's very easy, I think, to fall in that trap of, of fast food or even if it's not fast food from a fast food restaurant, but fast food from the grocery mm -hmm. store, you know, you buy something in a box and, and not necessarily the way to go. And I've, I've heard people describe shopping the exterior of the grocery store. I don't know if you can talk to us a little bit about diet and just some of the things that people need to, need to be aware of. And, and both of you can, can participate in this one, right. if you will. So <clears throat> fried chicken ribs is not <laughs> the answer, okay? So more healthy salads without having, so many times I'd say to a patient, have a salad, and then they want to add turkey, cheese, and all that, and a big creamy dressing, yeah. right? So you really have to have a nice sort of all-colored salad with balsamic or Italian dressing, right? So that's kind of where we start with, um, and a lot of times there's some pushback, but eventually some people like, uh, like it. One of the things I've started advocating is Meatless Monday, um, and I tell people, look, I'm not a vegan, but if I had diabetes, hypertension, was on 13 pills, I might eat like a rabbit because um, there's no side effects. Um, so uh, we go through this with, with them. And there's always what's interesting is I say, well, you need to become a vegetarian. And they say, well, I gave up steak. Well, yes, <laughs> but <laughs> that includes eggs, fish, whatever, right? I mean, invariably, that's what they say. Well, Dr. Ferreira, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of, of hamburgers. I'm a big fan <laughs> of steaks. I love red meat. I, I you know, again, I'm probably like 90% of the people mm -hmm. watching this. I, I like all of the things that that are, are bad for me. But you know, one of the things that my physician, who also practices there at River East, has told me is to try to cut back on those things. Eat more fish. Eat more leafy greens. That sort of thing. It's a bit of a challenge, but once you kind of start falling in the habit, it gets a little easier. Absolutely, there are diets that have been shown that reduce the risk of having uh, cardiovascular disease. Among them are the Mediterranean diet, also the DASH diet. But the overall emphasis of having a hearty health diet is really trying to incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your diet. Uh, preferring whole grains is definitely something that's recommended as well. And trying to obtain protein from a healthy source, for example, trying to eat more legumes or nuts fish and seafood, and if you're going to have dairy products, trying to have low-fat dairy products. Um, also trying to avoid processed foods such as red meat is encouraged, no added salt, no added sugars, and trying to avoid tropical oils. Tropical oils include palm oil or um, coconut oil. The oils that I actually recommend is olive oil. Interesting. So. So, Dr. Jackson, when, when you talk to your patients, is there a certain age range that you really start looking at people uh, as far as the potential for having heart disease, it, you know, it's hit their 50s, their 40s, or is that uh, a, a misnomer? 20s, 30s. <laughs> really? Honestly, wow. because we're seeing <clears throat> that these kids are more obese than when I grew up, yeah. right? Because they supersize everything, yeah. right? So, I would say a healthy diet should be all your life. I don't think there's a particular cutoff. Uh, for that. Um, so um, I think probably you would agree, Dr. Ferreira, that uh, the younger the better. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I think being healthy, eating healthy, and exercising is a way of life, really. And I think that the earlier that you start doing these changes, uh, it definitely l lowers your risk tremendously to develop heart disease. Um, I am internal medicine, so I typically only see uh, patients above the age of 18, but once they start coming into my office, I start screening them, and I recommend them to have yearly physicals. Some people might be a little bit reluctant, and they're like, no, I, I don't think I have to come every year, especially if I'm healthy, 
But the way that I see it is that a lot can change in a year. You know, um, I think that if anything that the past couple of years have taught us is that the way that we live can change and it can change significantly. And so um, I've had patients where they've had transition to more stressful jobs. And because of that, they've had changes in their diet and uh, poor diet and poor sleep. And their numbers from one year to the next have increased significantly. So I'm a very big advocate of getting yearly examinations. Let's talk about the stress uh, aspect of things, particularly when it comes to diet, because I think that's, that's a pretty valid uh, comment, particularly with COVID. I think there are a lot of folks that have, have experienced stressors in their lives that they probably haven't experienced before. And for a lot of folks, coping mechanism might be eating or eating poorly. Um, have you seen a lot of that? And if so, how, how do you work with your patients uh, to, to deal with that? With yeah, you know, unfortunately, like I said, over the last couple of years, the level of stress has increased. Um, I think that a big component is sleep. Um, I one of the first questions that I that I ask my patients, uh, amongst the, the questions that I ask my patients when they come, is, "Are they sleeping okay at night?" And the question would be, "Are you sleeping okay?" Uh, but the reason behind it is that it's not only how much you sleep, but it's also the quality of sleep that you get. And so that uh, plays a tremendous role in not only your cardiovascular health, but also your emotional health. And so um, trying to tease out these questions and basically trying to uh, give tips into uh, better ways to how to cope with stress, but also doing simple things that we might not see, like sleeping well, is, is a big one. So we do have uh, some viewer questions coming in. Wanted to get to uh, as uh, always as many as possible. Uh, during the program, uh, this question is, what should people with a family history, uh, but whom otherwise typically feel healthy, what should they look out for? And either one of you can take that one. <clears throat> make sure to check your lipid level. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> make sure to get your blood pressure checked. Don't smoke. Come see your primary care or cardiologist. You may be a candidate for a CT scan of the chest or for an echocardiogram. So when you talk about lipid levels, what, uh, what should people look for and what, what does that mean? So what we're looking for, there's really three components we look for. The total cholesterol, <coughs> the LDL, which is the low density lipids, and then the HDL. The higher your HDL, the better your survival. The lower the LDL, the better your survival. So if you are diabetic or have a family history or have had previous heart disease, we'd like you below 100, if not closer to 70. Um, and that can be done through medication, diet, or some combination. And, and blood pressure, I imagine, varies greatly with age. and, and It can, but it still should be treated aggressively no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm. And um, we try and get you now into the 110s. That's called optimal. And so we're shooting for that now. And so some patients may wind up on five pills. And then if they have sleep issues like sleep apnea, that can drive the blood pressure up too. So we treat the sleep apnea, we give them their pills, they exercise, they change their diet, and their outcomes are usually pretty optimistic. That's great. Dr. Ferrer, let's talk a little bit more about sleep because that's been brought up a couple of times and the importance of sleep. And you mentioned the quality of sleep is so important. How, how do you know if you have good quality sleep? I mean, you, you go to bed and you wake up in the morning, I, how do you know if it's been a good eight hours or not? Well, ideally, you should feel rested the next morning. I think that's an important point. Uh, one of the questions that we ask uh, our patients who we suspect a sleep disorder, uh, whichever, especially sleep apnea is, do you feel rested in the morning? So if you slept, um, it is recommended for us to get at least seven hours of sleep, an average from seven to nine. And if the person is getting that adequate amount of sleep, but they don't feel rested in the morning, then that's definitely a red flag. Are there ways you can track your sleep? I know with, with my watch, it supposedly tracks my sleep and can kind of tell me if I've, got, uh, if I've had a good night's rest or not. I don't know how accurate that is, though. I don't know if I believe it or not. There, there's definitely um, application, you know, like the smartwatches. They yeah. will, the smartwatch will actually tell you uh, how many hours you've been in REM sleep and the stages. And so I think it's, it's, it's definitely a good tool to use. Yeah. So if you, if you do think that you're not getting a good night's sleep, um, I know there are experts that, that you can see even, of course, here at UChicago Medicine that can do sleep studies and things like that. What, what happens? I know that's not your area of expertise, but if you can kind of generally tell us, what does that mean? What, what happens if somebody has something like that? 
Well, if the patient comes to our office and th we suspect that they're having, again, any sleep disorder, because there's others, not necessarily only sleep apnea, although sleep apnea is a big one that we screen for, um, then typically we refer to the um, sleep medicine clinic. Uh, they're very useful. We work very closely with them. And what they do is they go into a consultation and they'll also ask uh, questions and then they'll determine whether they're a good candidate for a sleep study or you know, other tests to kind of tease out if there are any other sleep abnormalities. So um, we talked a little bit about screening tests. Let's talk about physical activity because that's obviously an important thing that I think particularly in this day and age, a lot of us probably don't get a much enough physical activity. How much should a person have each day or, or each week? And, and what are some good things to do if you're not like a, a big athlete? So I think walking, <clears throat> to start with walking. Now the three best exercises are swimming, biking, and walking. Um, swimming because it's easy on the joints, bicycling, same thing, and then run, walking, running would be next. So the longest lived people often aren't high performance athletes, but when you look at them, they walk a lot. Just simple walking is a good place to start. Um, not everyone has to train for the US judo team, right? So, so a lot of patients wanna go back to their high school workout in football, right? Which was, as we now know, inappropriate anyway. So I'd like to just start slowly, recommend yoga, tai chi for some of our older folks so that you get both resistance and flexibility. And then a simple walking program, water aerobics for those who have um, knee problems. Um, I try and say anywhere from three to five days a week, um, anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes should be enough. Um, for some people they wanna max it out, that's fine, but the curve of how much that benefits starts flattening at some point. Um, if you go to Europe, you'll see all these ladies who walk places, can't even spell gym. You know, never been in one, but they're 95, 100 years old. Yeah, you know, the benefits of walking, I think, uh, are oftentimes underrated with yeah. a lot of folks. And, and to your point, um, I think a lot of us feel like, you know, you have to go and really spend some, some time in the gym right. doing a heavy Gone workout, home. and that's not necessarily right. what you need to do. Correct. Which I'll is good news. Yeah. So if you're already working hard, that's okay. But for 55, 60 year olds, your cardiac workout is probably the most important. I mean, you need resistance training and you need flexibility just to pre prevent falls. But uh, for your heart, again, it reaches a level that at some point sort of maxes out. Interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit about, um, we talked about what's, what are good things to eat, but how do you get folks started on kind of to ramp up that heart healthy eating plan? And Dr. Ferrer, if you could, kind of guide us through that and, and uh, you know, maybe how we could, we could help ourselves on that. Absolutely, I think this is a great conversation to have, initial conversation to have with your primary care physician. And I'm a very big advocate of baby steps. Uh, it's very hard, it's very hard to change the way that you've been eating for a long time or the way that you've been doing anything for a long time. So you have to make a habit of it. And just as in regards to exercise, you, you I, I tell my patients, please don't go tomorrow run like you're gonna train for a marathon because the next day you're not gonna wanna get up because you're gonna be <laughs> sore. Well, it's the same thing uh, regarding eating, just making healthier choices. Start small. Uh, you know, if you're somebody that's having, drinking five sodas per week, try to cut down, cut down to three. You know, so I think that uh, choosing attainable goals that you can sustain over a long period of time, I think that is a great initial point. Here's a question from Cynthia, it's regarding exercise. Uh, she says, I use my steps at home, about 15 steps, up and down for three rounds as exercise. Does that, does that help or count? Yes, <laughs> it's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very happy with that. Don't shovel snow. Talk to <laughs> us a little die. bit about shoveling snow, <laughs> because we always hear about that, you know, people having heart attacks. Is there something specific to that? Yeah, I have seen that? at least five men come in with that, with VTAC too. Really? Uh, yeah, so wow. there's something about the heaviness of the snow, the cold weather, right? And sort of being out of shape and trying to live as a teenager again. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, we find them in the snow holding the shovel in their hand or they come in Thanks. with the chest pain. Um, so 
I, you know, that's what teenagers are for, right? God created them <laughs> to help you with, uh, you know. I mean, that's what I used to do for my dad, right? So, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm call my teenagers right. and see if we can get them. Well, <laughs> right. they're not teenagers anymore. Yeah. Right. But, you know, that's funny because I, I was wondering, it's not funny, but it's right. interesting. I was wondering if that is, because is, we hear that all oh, the time, every winter, and I, I wondered how. I had a guy who came in, what, three days ago. He'd been shoveling and had chest pain. What should I do? So I sent him to the ER. Wow. Well, <laughs> that's what you should do. So speaking right. of chest pains, because I think this is, is an interesting point as well, what, what constitutes significant chest pains to come and see a doctor or go to the ER? It's, if, you know, because we've all been there where maybe you've been several nights now and you think maybe you just pulled a muscle or something like that and you don't want to be a big baby and go to right. the hospital and then things go south from right. there. Well, it's kind of an interesting question. There is no right answer. <clears throat> and in women, it can be an atypical presentation, yeah. right? It's not the classic, uh, the, the uh, elephant sitting on my chest. So what I tell people, they say, oh, I didn't have chest pain. So now I've started to use the term discomfort. Yeah. Because for them, pain means like somebody like filleted them open and you know, um, torture them. So is that because women have a higher tolerance than men? Well, it's interesting. Um, so there was a, a recent study on that, and um, that may be part of it. Um, but I think that we don't listen to women, quite frankly. Um, so that may be part of it, too. Um, that also includes, tragically, sometimes women physicians, too, um, not just the men, which is sad because that means we've been acculturated the same way. Right. And, um, but yeah, so I just tell people, is it that feeling that you just don't feel we, you know, great? So it's easier to go to the ER, get an EKG, versus getting a call that you know, the funeral home would like you to sign the death certificate. Yeah, yeah. Another question from a viewer, can diet and exercise alone eliminate the need for statins in patients with high cholesterol or high HDL? So there is a study uh, using, again, there's I'm not a vegan, but the data is beginning to even sway me. Um, so there is data that if you can use a real plant-based diet, there's a guy out of Cleveland Clinic named Caldwell Esselstyn who has a book on this, Reversing Heart Disease. There's Dean Ornish has written something on this. And uh, hey, you know, they have shown reversal. Um, I don't think that's true in all cases, but it is compelling that at least you can postpone it for a long time. Um, so if you can adhere to this and you're LDL and HDL are what we need them to be. Some people come off of it. However, you must stay on that vegan vegetarian diet forever. Otherwise, your numbers will go right back up. So I don't advise people to stop statins if they're on them. But if you want to really max it out, you become a vegan. Now, those pretend meats that they serve, right? <laughs> beyond burger or beyond this and that. When you look at, when you look at the back of the package, right? There was a historian who said, if you want to hide something from people, put it in print. <laughs> so if you read the back of it, you'll see that the saturated fat level, because of coconut oil, you were talking about the tropical oils, right? Interesting. And the sodium content are as much as a Whopper. Wow. Okay. If you look at turkey bacon, for example, turkeys don't have bacon. <laughs> so it's made in a lab, right? And so it's, it's, so really read labels, right? Um, don't just blow them off, right? Um, and canned anything in the United States is loaded with salt or loaded with sugar. Yeah. So you have to be sort of the, you know, concerned reader. You know, Dr. Ferrer, I was eating, a, I just, it was cold and I was in a hurry and I grabbed a can of soup the other day out of the cupboard and I, I did look at the back on it and I was stunned with the level of sodium because it had more than what my whole US or my whole uh, <laughs> daily allowance of, of sodium was supposed <laughs> to be just in that one can of soup. So, you know, it's an excellent point. I, I do, I, I want to throw this out to, to both of you because it's kind of a fun question coming in from a viewer. As a non-vegan, what's your favorite vegetarian recipe? And I don't know if you can come up with something right off your head. Dr. Ferrer, I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> um, I have family members that are vegetarians. I am not a vegetarian myself. <laughs> so I, uh, unfortunately, out of the top of my head, I don't have any uh, preferred uh, vegetarian recipe. Um, Let me throw this out to you. Beans and rice, <laughs> right? Lentils, right? So I just ate at the uh, Nile restaurant. I had lentil soup. I had falafel. I had hummus and baba ganoush, which are spreads. Now, uh, just a little exotic. I, I thought know. you weren't a vegetarian, though. Yeah. I'm not a vegan, but I will eat mainly that stuff. I see. Uh, but, uh, you know, 
I think that, so, so spaghetti with marinara, a salad with all colors, fruits, and vegetables, um, oatmeal with almond milk. I mean, there's a variety of things that even we omnivores slash carnivores mm -hmm. can tolerate. Excellent. Another question from a viewer, or this is from Jill. Can someone in their 80s have a successful open heart valve replacement surgery? When are you not a good candidate? That's an interesting one. So the answer is yes. We have these new techniques where we can actually go, we don't have to open you up. It's called a TAVR, right? A mm -hmm. trans, so basically it's a catheter procedure to, to replace the, the valve. Yeah. Now, of course, it depends on which valve, uh, but the success rate, especially here at the University of Chicago, um, are as good or better than anyone in the country. Um, so yes, you can have it. We can do it using catheters without necessarily using um, open heart surgery in selected cases. In some cases, we do wind up having to open you up. Yeah, you know, it is interesting. I th that's something that's <clears throat> been just fascinating to me here at U, U, U Chicago Medicine is the ability to do some of these surgeries. Oh, we're yeah. cracking on the check. I, just I remember my father, and this was years ago, had a heart attack and he had uh, multiple bypasses, and they had to open him up. Mm. and And I, I talked to him about some of the things that were done by you know, robotically here, yes. and he said, boy, if that would have been available Absolutely. Uh, in his time, he sure would have loved to have had that. Yep. I, I think it makes a big difference in the quality of life for patients. For sure. So we are about out of time. Dr. Oh. Ferreira, I want to get kind of uh, some closing thoughts from you, and then Dr. Jackson will let you, uh, oh, we got, let, let me, hang on, I've got one more question from a viewer, so let's do this real quickly. Dr. Ferreira, what can be done, this is from Mary, what can be done for a high heart rate, and when should something be done? This is a person who's 68 years old. Uh, well, the, typically the resting heart rate of somebody uh, who's not an athlete should be between 60 to 100. And um, re uh, people that exercise uh, more often, they'll have lower heart rates. Uh, typically, they can go even to the 40s. Okay. Um, if it's something, and the good thing about having Apple Watches now is you can actually monitor your heart rate too, whether you're at resting. And I'll have a lot of my patients tell me, I was doing laundry yesterday or watching TV and my heart rate shot up to 140s or 130. So if you see that your heart rate is consistently elevated and then you have those spikes and then on top of that you're having symptoms, whether uh, you have palpitations with typically the patients will describe it as, oh, I felt like my heart skipped a beat, then it's definitely a good time to go see your primary care physician. Yeah, um, I love that question because you mentioned people and I, I do that myself. I watch my heart rate occasionally on my, on my watch. And if, if you do see those those spikes, sometimes it can, can alarm you a little bit. It doesn't necessarily mean you're having an issue, but if it's regular, you're saying you probably should talk to somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. All right, so now I'm gonna let you uh, have your, your final word, if you, if you will, Dr. Ferrer. Yes, um, you know, heart disease definitely is very common. And again, it's the leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of resources out there talking about, we talked about you know, physical activity, we talked about diet, we talked about, there are other factors also that influence having heart disease, high, higher risk for heart disease like smoking or uh, obesity. Uh, the American Heart Association has a website and they have absolutely excellent resources there where you can get tips for healthy eating, uh, tips to quit smoking, and tips to how to incorporate more exercise in your daily routine. So I would definitely recommend that if you're interested in trying to live a healthier lifestyle, then that's probably a good resource to look up. Fantastic. Dr. Jackson, any party shots? Yes. Eat to live, don't live to eat, <laughs> right? And walk, right? Walk, stop smoking, um, enjoy life, uh, have a prayerful and meditative life, enjoy your family, um, and come see your primary care physician. Yeah, are, you both have uh, fantastic advice, and, and uh, that was really really good stuff and, and good questions too. We are out of time though. Special thanks to our guests for being with us today and a big thank you to those of you who watched and participated in the program. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs coming up in the future. To make an appointment, go online to uchicagomedicine.org or give us a call at 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today and I hope everyone has a great weekend.